Thank you very much. Um, our keynote speaker, Andy Grove, is a smart man because he focused on his formula and problems in medicine and healthcare innovation, and he, he, he highlighted medical education. And I thought he was talking to me as I was sitting in the back row. So we've got two folks here from one of the world's elite academic medical institutions. How do we promote innovation in an academic health center, medical school, hospital? You want to start? Sure. <laughs> um, so that's what my center is about. The Center for Innovation and Global Health is about trying to promote medical education amongst not just the medical students, but reaching out across the entire university. So one of the ways that we work at Stanford, and we're, we're well known for this, sometimes we do it well, sometimes we do it not so well, is having a multidisciplinary approach. And that's one of the hallmarks of innovation, is bringing in people who don't really know what they're talking about, about a particular problem, and getting fresh minds on it. So we try to do that and bring people who are engineers or business students or law students or humanities students and introduce them to issues of healthcare and see what they come up with. Oftentimes, we find that some of the best ideas come, as we've heard a lot today, from people who haven't been studying in a very small way a big problem. But because they can pull back, they're able to see different possibilities. And that's, that's one way that we do it. The other is that we get micro. And we work with our, our scientists in a very particular way to build up wonderful labs and amazing expertise in very small, slim areas so that they can, instead of looking broad, look really small and get really into the detail. And I think that around medical education, it's the combination of those two things, being able to bring in enough folks so you have a big picture and the expertise so you've got a small, very expert view on micro pieces of the problem. Crashing those together is where we see the biggest innovations coming. And to do that, you have to have an environment in which you can question. Um, we'll, I'm cert certain we will hear some questions of some of the assumptions we've been hearing today come from us, because that's what we do as academics. Um, and you have a place where it's, a, it's safe to explore. So I'll take, your view. I'll take my stab at uh, answering that. So I think most people in this audience have gone to college, and many of you have gone to graduate school. I think you, have a, you remember that perspective of what college or university was like. You went and saw the courses, and you uh, did the homework and the problem sets. But there's another aspect to those universities that you might not have really ever been exposed to, and that's the research side of things. And I think uh, it's just an amazing uh, engine for innovation. When you think about just, for example, Stanford, and the companies get launched uh, out of Stanford going back decades. Uh, you know the history of uh, Silicon Valley. It comes from uh, uh, an incubator like Stanford. Now, I think there's more direct investments. Now, I think it's, uh, it's especially in a medical school setting, if you're a faculty member, uh, your goal is really to translate those paper, papers and those journal articles you write into real products. And I think, uh, for example, Stanford is unique in some ways to offer courses to faculty every Wednesday with dinner. How do you start up a company? If you're a grad student, how do you go get seed financing? So I think the old universities you might have remembered from a long time ago uh, have uh, really modernized with the times to face this uh, kind of uh, innovation challenge. So we've heard, I think, everyone here, and I, I, I thought the speed dating session was fantastic because we got to meet entrepreneurs, and I think I have a sense of what is on many of your minds. The cross-functional team, absolutely essential for success, and I think you brought that up. The freedom to discover also unbelievable, and then the word that you used, which is translation. Those three things are now axiomatic, really, if you're for advancing healthcare innovation. Uh, yeah, I mean, so what I would argue, though, is so, so in some ways you could view us, in some ways, I'm already getting a sense, as the enemy here, right? Because we're the establishment, right? We've been in business for over 100 years as Stanford, right? And you all come along, you, you're going to try to incubate, incubate and innovate around us and faster than us. And I totally can respect that. I think there are some benefits from working within an establishment as well, uh, uh, including within healthcare. And uh, so I was too chicken to put my hand up when uh, Vinod asked for uh, doctors to uh, kind of critique him, but I'm not too chicken now. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm going, so, I want to ask the audience so, a question here. So you're, you're, we have a real pediatrician here. I'm a real pediatrician. Right, so. I, I'm on my eighth startup company. I worked at Apple and Microsoft. I know how to code. 
Okay, but let me ask this audience a question though. Okay, so how many of you uh, work uh, 60, 70, 80 hour uh, weeks right now? Yeah, pretty much everyone, right? So how many of you have ever had that check engine light come on in your car? Okay, fine. So since for the past 10 years, there's been a standard interface to diagnose your car. It's called the OBD2. It's the Onboard Diagnostic 2 protocol. <laughs> How many of you own the $200 gizmo to diagnose your car? There are like six, seven hands in this audience. Now, why is it that you go to an expert to change your oil? Why is it that you go to an expert to even listen to the rattles under your engine? Because you're pretty damn busy. And actually taking care of your health and your life isn't the focus of your life, right? It's something you need to get working and you want to move on. And I think that's the way you should view medicine too. This is not the focus of your life to go to a doctor. This is someone's going to help keep things in order when you need an expert and move on. It's the same reason why none of us in this audience use paper and pencil to fill out tax forms, right? Best case, we use a software package. Of course, the software package doesn't give you advice for the next year. And maybe most of us actually use a tax accountant, a real person to help us. How many of you use a tax accountant to fill out your taxes? Okay, so that's about a third of the audience here. So why are we so afraid of using a doctor in the same type of way? I don't think we should have that much resistance. Yes, medicine needs to change and adapt. We're doing some things horribly old. It's not voodoo. There is an 80-20 rule. A lot of it could be automated. But I think there are some advantages to working within a system as well. Right, and, and, and you know, it's dean of a medical school, which is probably number one, I said the number one job of a dean is not to squash the medical student's altruism on the first day of medical school, really. And, I, and, and just, just to protect myself, I brought three, three of my medical students with me <laughs> and two of our engineers to prove and, it. And oh, by the way, we, we, at you, one of the things that leaders can do is to promote innovation. When people come with a goofy idea, Sorry. say yes, uh, at, at both, I know at Stanford and also at USC, we let our medical students spend a year off and we pay them to do research. And, and a, a number of the entrepreneurs that I talked to were residents or medical students. And I would say this to those of you who are interested in moving ahead in healthcare entrepreneurship. If I was going to say what is the best group of people to reach out to, they're young faculty members, fellows, residents, and medical students. because. They're creative, they have lots of things. Somebody like uh, Dr. Butte, he was a polymath. He worked at Microsoft, he worked at uh, Apple. If you look at the medical students that are coming to a place like USC, we have 186 students that come from the finest universities, have diverse backgrounds, all kinds of great science and technology. Many of them have spent a year or two off. So really, we've, in the United States at least, we've got an engine of great students, both PhDs yeah. and MDs, that are open to innovation. And so we can, we can do and create that. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo that for a second. I think most people remember their own physicians, okay? And I think there's no way that guy's ever going to use an iPad. There's no way that that gal is ever going to get computerized. But you have to remember today's medical students are younger than you, most of the people in the audience here today. And they already get it, and they get it to an order of magnitude, maybe even more than you do. They're the ones doing the startup companies and like Duxibity and all these others. I mean, there's many others in this space. Work with them is what I think we're trying to say. Here. On, on the first day of medical school at USC, we ask every student to write down a little a autobiography of what they're interested in doing and what they think they will do. And I would say that one thing that emerges every year is about 30% of the class says, I'm interested in participating in global health. And Amy, this is, this is your realm. How do we, we've talked to here about all these digital health interventions. How do we hook up this interest among physicians with, with these potential products to the vast needs of global health? Um, I'll get there. But first, I, I wasn't able to, to break in. Um, I just want to say as the non-doctor on the stage, um, I spend a lot of time with these guys. Um, a lot of time with the doctor researchers, love you. A lot of time with the doctor academics, love you. A lot of time with the doctor doctors, uh -huh. love you. Uh -huh. Thank you for teaching people, thank you for healing people. But you don't have to be a doctor to understand a lot of medicine. And I want to just give voice to, to that as a person who has a degree in communications, which everybody thinks is really soft and squishy, mm. and then I went to business school. Um, 
I still know something about health. And it's not because it's about me and what I need as a customer, it's because I spend time listening. One of the most amazing parts of today was, um, was the quote from Voltaire. Now I know Voltaire is old, so maybe that's not quite innovation, but let's bring it back. You know, these ideas of listening, of paying attention to, to our clients, of paying attention to patients, and understanding and empathizing is part of what I really think is missing out of medicine these days. And the thing I was too chicken to say to, um, to Vinod is, <laughs> I'm afraid of there only being machines. The yeah. fact of the matter is, when I look at the way that we're yeah. innovating in medicine right now, we're taking the human component out of it. Right. And when that happens, the human body is so complicated, we don't know how to give the data correctly. And without that kind of interaction, we're always going to get it wrong. Right. And if that's innovation, if that's the answer, I don't want any part of it. Because that empathy and that ability to connect, that's the real part of, I think, what gets us to really enjoy life and live very fully. Now, this relates to, surprisingly enough, your question about global health. Um, lots of time we have both medical students, business school students, engineers, everybody wants to work in global health these days. Right. Maybe not everybody, but lots of people, of or people. they think they do. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, people want to do this kind of work because they've seen Angelina Jolie or Madonna or somebody, orphan, there's orphan babies, bring a baby into the situation and everybody wants to get on board. The thing is, it's a lot more complicated than that. And it's messy and it's dirty. And the big secret about doing global health is that it's mostly not about technology. Mm -hmm. It's about figuring out how do you get something that we know works. Maybe it's not Tylenol. Maybe it's, I don't know, um, ORS for getting liquids into people yeah. who need hydration when they've got diarrhea. Simple, simple solution. It's water, salt, sugar. Not so technologically difficult. Doesn't seem like it should be so hard. Millions of people die mm -hmm. every year because we can't deliver that. Yeah. So, there are needs for innovation that have nothing to do with a lot of the fancy mechanics of it. And that's the kind of thing that we need to make sure that when our students come in with enthusiasm from wherever they come, that they understand that it's about getting into the nitty gritty, the dirty, the truly the shit of what's happening in order to understand how you can really innovate. And we have to inspire them to see ways to innovate that aren't fancy and shiny yep. and patentable, but that are just simple and good and save lives. Right. And that only happens when there are humans involved. Yeah, we're, we're gonna talk about big data and personalized medicine, but I to carry on two points that you made. When, when the American Association of Medical Colleges surveys the public about what they think medical schools should be doing and talk to the public, the number one thing that comes across is, and it's usually phrased this way, teach, medical students better bedside manner. So, and, and I think most medical schools actually now, we, we actually try to work on that. Yeah. And because that precious interaction between patient and physician is, is there, yes. Yeah, so I'm just following the Twitter stream here. Marcella made a point in the audience here. We're talking about physicians all the time, but there's nurses, there's yes. PAs, there's every other Absolutely. ancillary health that you're seeing an extreme case in some ways. And, there is room for innovating at every step, uh, especially those that are closer to uh, the patients uh, than necessarily the physicians and, and, are. And I would say uh, um, that that's a big problem with yeah. medical education in general. Physi go back to physicians. What you said about teams is absolutely true about care delivery as well. And in the US, we've siloed a lot of education and we've siloed a lot of innovation. So that, 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 that's, that's true. That's right. What about? practical, what are the business opportunities in global health? I mean... The business opportunities? Business opportunities. The money making opportunities well, I mean, or the business Many of the people here are entrepreneurs with an application or a, a lot of this is actually interestingly focused on digital health, not yeah. on medical devices and drugs. Yep. And I've got an observation about why that's the case actually. Well, technology, and I mean, I, I am making a very strong point by pushing it all the way to say that there's nothing that's shiny. I mean, there is absolutely a wave of technology that is being applied in resource-constrained settings, and it's because in lots of places we have jumped over having wired systems for telephones, and we're, we see the mobile phone revolution. Um, you, can, you can't go anywhere without hearing about this when we marry it to global health. There are amazing opportunities of ways to use sensors, to use cell phones, both for communication, mm -hmm. for reading things about what's happening with the body, for sending 
images back and forth. Um, there's an, there is an amazing space for technology in that way. There's also just some of the simple functionings of the organizations that are delivering health. Right. So when, when you think about business opportunities, it's not just about the new device, although it can be, the new product or the mm -hmm. new service. It could also be about making the products and services that are available now more efficient and accessible to more people. And a lot of that really truly has to do with distribution. Right. So if there was one area that I, I would ask people to please start looking into, it would be figure out why the heck we can't get ORS to the folks that need it. It's a distribution problem. It's not manufacturing. It's not technology. It's not, not understanding the problem. It's distribution. Why is it so hard to get a simple product to someone who needs it? I don't know the answer to that. I know Coke figured it out. I know the beer companies figure it out. I know the cigarette companies figure it out. So what's going on? Yeah. I think that's a huge business opportunity around global health. Um, there are certainly other pieces that have to do with technologies. And, and those things will rise up and the best ones will, will stick around with us. And I think that that's a very worthwhile place to spend time. Um, I would say from what I've seen of the technologies that come up, it is important for when you have something that is for the developing world that you think about having a dual strategy. It is very hard to make money off of poor people. Yep. Um, so if CK Prasad was here, I would also disagree with him. Um, I don't think there's a fortune to be made at the bottom of the pyramid. And I think it is irresponsible for people to think that you should try to make money off of poor people all the time. You can make some money from poor people, and you can make some money from rich people. Right. But please don't try to make money off of the poor people. They've got enough burden as it is. So we've talked about simple interventions. Yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Butte, you, you run. So I'm the complex. Well, yes. you're, a, you're a genomics, uh, yeah. big data set, analysis guy. Where do you see that going, yeah. and how does that connect with this crowd? Yeah, so I'll try to get you a sense as to why I get excited. So uh, two big directions that I see. Uh, one is in our improving ability to measure molecules. I tend to think about molecules a lot. Um, I have my usual props here. So you can, uh, I'm just holding up here uh, what's called an Affymetrix gene chip. So I'll stand up here for a second so everyone sees this. So this one chip here lets us quantitate every gene in the genome. Quantitate means to measure the levels of. And it, you know, Affymetrix even packages it to look like a uh, microprocessor. And uh, that's one of them. And the way we scale in life science is we love 96 well plates. So now here's 96 of them. And each one of these gets a separate sample of cancer, diabetes, normal tissue, and you just quantitate every gene in the genome with these. And this is amazing technology. We can measure every single gene in the genome. What really gets me uh, up in the morning is not that we can measure all these things, but that we as researchers now have to share this data on the internet. If we want to publish on this kind of data, we have to deposit this into the NIH's repositories or the European repositories. Uh, as of August 1st, actually, we just hit the milestone of one million of these publicly available. So you today, when you go home for your homework, you can go to the websites and you can actually today download 33,000 samples of, for example, breast cancer. That's more samples that you will download overnight tonight than any breast cancer researcher will ever have in their lab. Because if any one of those researchers wants to publish on their data, you'll have it plus their competitors. And the growth rate of this is finally slowing down to Moore's Law, okay? Slowing down to Moore's Law because of the next technology I'll talk about with genome sequencing. But I want to make this point that this data is here and any high school kid can go download it. Even you can go download it too. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's really kind of driving my world is this uh, genome sequencing revolution. Uh, I know you guys heard a lot about genome sequencing and things. I have my own set of analogies. Uh, the genome is six billion base pairs. Six billion is an impossibly huge number to think about. The simplest way to think about it is 4,000 copies of the joy of cooking. How many of you have the joy of cooking at home? Yeah, that to me is the ultimate of wishful thinking, right? <laughs> we want to we have it there in the kitchen. And just like the, like the 4,000 copies, your DNA is basically a bunch of recipes. Now, you, you're in San Francisco. You know there are great restaurants. There are poor restaurants. They're lousy restaurants, right? And one example why the lousy restaurants are lousy has to do with the recipe books. Of course, they could have bad chefs, they could have bad ingredients, but one component of it could be the recipe books. 
and same thing for humans. One component of why we could have diseases or be set up for diseases is because of our recipes are different from each other. And that's, those are differences in DNA. Uh, as we all know, the Genome Project took 13 years and $3 billion, and now we're down to about $8,000 to quantitate or measure, uh, actually sequence your entire genome. And uh, by the end, of this, uh, cent at the end of this decade, 2020, I think the costs are coming down to estimate about $33 per genome. I've definitely paid more for that than for parking today uh, than it will cost me to get my genome. So I think uh, understanding the utility of that, especially in the medical world, is another kind of area, big open area today. So one of the things that I just want to point out about how universities function, um, and because I'm an administrator in, in a university, I can, I can sort of point these things out, is that the university ends up being a place where we do a ton of research that nobody else would ever do. It is, the, it is the place in our society where you can try things with absolutely no chance of it working. And it's fine, because it's a learning process, because we're balancing both the outcome of having something that may potentially go well with the process of teaching students how to do research well. And that means that we are the biggest risk takers out there, because we are, the required rate of return can be negative yeah. for a university. This means that we are amazing places for entrepreneurs and scientists to try to put their researches in and partner with, because we aren't going to, for the most part, take any ownership stake, although there are some complications around that, and it's important to understand what those are, so please make sure you do before you get into a relationship. Um, but there is, there is a chance to do a lot of work and have access to labs, experts, the, whatever their, their, um, our, our belief about experts may be, and an amazing group of students that will run around and do all sorts of analysis that you could never, ever pay for um, with, with the same kind of um, return out of it. And the folks that I am most, most I love our faculty. We, our faculty are amazing. But if I were going to put my dollar on anyone, it'd be on a freshman. A freshman at Stanford is probably smarter than 20 of us. And I don't know what that is. Maybe the gene sequencing will explain it to me one day. But there is a resource of students out there that are hungry to do work and understand this. And the only pay they need is maybe a little bit to go out on the weekends and the experience. And they're available for entrepreneurs and, and, and folks to tap into. You just have to know where. So Dr. B, can you comment a little bit about the role of clinicians and and the role of face-to-face -face patient concept, contact in driving innovation. Yeah, I think, so the role of the physicians in the healthcare setting, I think, is without either having that experience or working with those folks with that kind of experience, you end up creating simple solutions to superficial problems, right? And I think when you start to dive in deep, uh, it doesn't take very long. For example, Paul Yock's biodesign program at Stanford, I think they spend one day or a couple of days on the wards and their one first day exercise to list 200 unmet needs in medicine in the first day, okay? It doesn't take very long to figure out the unmet needs, but the, the more you get exposed, the more you, you realize the, the sophistication that's needed beyond just setting up yet another you know, medical photo sharing site, yet another medical social networking site. Those are great, but let's get beyond that into some of the more sophistication. I think that's where the role of the clinicians, where the medical setting would come out. I, I, I feel very, very strongly about that because I'm a medical imaging guy, and I started out my career in 1981 by meeting a graduate student at MIT, and together, we've worked together really for almost 30 years developing stuff, but I can tell you that translation is super important to everyone in this room because translation is the only way you're going to make money. In other words, if you have an idea, you need to translate it into reality. And, the, and being in a sophisticated clinical environment and having sophisticated clinical colleagues can really make the difference in the world. We have a lot of people, you, if you do imaging, for instance, in an entirely abstract engineering setting, the, the, the chance of translation goes down. And, and that's a, a message that or take home point that I think that the audience really should take with them. And I just add that when we think about translation, we often think about translating from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And in this circumstance, I actually think it, 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 it's, it goes the other, goes it goes both, both ways. Yes. You start with the patient, you start with the need, you translate it into science, 
and things that I don't understand. And then it better translate back to the patient. Because if it doesn't, if it doesn't go both ways, if you didn't get the first part right, you created a hammer, and who knows if you need a hammer. Right. And if it only goes the other direction, who knows if your hammer is going to work. Exactly. So you have to make sure you're doing it both ways. But, but a lot of this stuff is still voyage of discovery. I mean, in other words, when we, were, when we started to work together, we never thought we were going to develop optical coherence tomography, which has really a very specific clinical We were looking at basic interaction. So that's the important thing. I mean, at universities, people can do discovery research without penalty. At least right now they can. And that's absolutely essential, I think. Yeah, I'm going to say there's actually, I see a lot of synergy now. Um, so a lot of people ask me, why do I go into academia even, right? Why not just go join some of the startup companies, and things like that? I think people don't realize, to me, academia is the best job in the world. Okay, it's the best job in the world. And if I can even convince one or two people to go into academia, uh, I will have done my job because it's increasingly getting harder to find folks who want to do this as a job. Imagine, imagine a job that pays you a full salary, but then one day a week lets you go do your own thing 20% time, right? And you can say, oh, well, Google does this, right? But I own everything I do in my 20% time, right? Stanford, Harvard, they let you start up companies as a faculty member in your 20% time. And for the most part, they don't own any of that. And in fact, they encourage you to do that. In fact, they train you to start up, how to start up companies and get funding and do this. They give you courses on this. So to me, I, I see a lot of synergy, right? What is my, most of my job? I write grants. And there's really no fundamental difference today between writing a good grant and writing a good business plan. If people aren't dying by the second sentence, and you're the only person in the world who knows how to fix it by the fourth <laughs> sentence, you will neither get VC funding on Sandel Road, nor will you convince NIH to give you money. It's the same exercise of convincing a room full of people with money to give you that money. But there isn't a, there's a continuum now, right? There's a continuum where sometimes the need is so immediate, you could just get something to patients right away or get something to providers, and you launch a company. Sometimes the need is so immediate, but the, the technology isn't there. We need to invest in the basic side of it. You write an NIH grant. And there's a continuum of innovation in between. And so the important thing is not to view academics or, or the universities as a kind of old-fashioned setting at all. I think a lot of innovation happens there. Uh, there are those of us who do view this as the way to drive innovation, uh, just like uh, the venture capital community does too. So, so Amy, what, what turns you on about your job, your current job, and how did you get to Stanford? Um, I had no idea I would ever end up in academia. And I, once you, you hear from Atul and you've been convinced to go into academia, make sure you talk to me. And I'll talk to you about some of the downsides, because there are downsides. Um, <laughs> but I'm a staff member, so it's a slightly different perspective. Um, I was a strategy consultant, and I liked solving problems. And then one day I was asked to um, create a, a branding campaign for a car seat company. Not like a baby car seat company, because as I've said, you throw a baby on something, and I want to do it. But it was just a car seat. And it wasn't important. I wanted to work on things that were important and things that made me angry. And inequality in healthcare is both important and makes me angry. And so I spend my time trying to work on that. And at Stanford, I have access to all these amazing students I've just told you about. And I get to spend most of my days talking yeah. to faculty and students and getting them excited about what, what they can do and trying to wipe out the challenges in front of them, show them <coughs> new pathways. Um, there are lots of me's around universities. It is our job to help other people succeed. It's the other small secret about what happens at places like Stanford. We hire people who want to see other people succeed. And we're behind the scenes, and we try to do whatever we can to get great people to meet their great potential. Are, are you optimistic about the future of health care? Let me make a, a very broad question. Absolutely. Why? I'm absolutely. Why? Um, because kids today, um, I never thought I'd say that, but kids today care. Kids today care in a way that um, I feel like my generation and the generation above me has um, forgotten to some degree. We get jaded, we get upset, we, we, life isn't fair and we didn't get what we wanted out of it. I don't know. College kids today, they're still really bright about this stuff and they come in thinking it is their responsibility to make their lives and others' lives better. Atul, are you a pessimist, optimist? You can tell I'm an between. optimist if it's not obvious. Why am I an optimist, right? I think uh, if the minute you have kids, I think you start to see optimism. 
uh, in the next generation. But if you really need a dose of optimism, what I'll just suggest is a couple things. First, go to the Tech Museum in San Jose. And on the third floor is the whole DNA exhibit. Yeah. And so why is that cool? Because my daughter goes up there, and when she's six years old, she sits down, she turns on the video, and she sees how to put on goggles, and she knows how to put on gloves, and she literally moves DNA, jellyfish GFP DNA, into a bacteria and plates it out, and they write their name. If they know how to write their name, they can write their name on the bottom of the Petri dish, and they stick it in the incubator, and the next morning, they see how their experiments do, right? They take a digital fit photo. They, you can log into the site, and you can see if your experiment grew out. My daughter at age six has already moved DNA from one species to another. That's what we do here in Silicon Valley. That's what we're really great at doing. If that doesn't make you optimistic, I don't know what to tell you. I just don't know what to tell you. <laughs> she's had more successful DNA experiments than I have in the lab. <laughs> now she's in fourth grade. She just started today. Uh, I just, how could you not be optimistic? I, I, I'm an optimist too. I, 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 I think that the new generation of healthcare providers are gonna be much more aligned to some of the idealistic thinking and the goal setting that, that we heard about earlier today. And I would say also, you know, doctors like to complain about everything. That's the nature of the beast. But in my own field, I was reflecting, and in, in, I'm an ophthalmologist and a retinal specialist. You know, in the last few years, we came up with a $600 a year cure for the leading cause of blindness in the industrialized world, wet macular degeneration, that was developed through a, a, a series of basic science and translation and just plain old discovery. So I think the future is bright, and I think what uh, Vinod said was true. Things are, technology is unstoppable, and it will, things will happen. Individuals can make a tremendous difference, and of course, our government can make a tremendous difference. I mean, the, the environment, the regulatory environment, and the funding for basic science, I, I think we've lost a little bit of the enthusiasm for that. And you know, we're talking about access, and I think access is going to be better. I mean, yeah. The other thing is, look at this room. I mean, if you were, if you were not optimistic before you came to this conference, look to your right and look to your left, because there's somebody in this place that's going to come up with something pretty damn amazing. That's what this is all yeah, about. Yeah. Good. So, Thanks. Let's thank, thank our panelists.